Right, so, you have to squint a little bit when I talk about this. Have an open mind and try and imagine what I'm talking about. So come with me as I show you around what will be the new pond. There's going to be a raised circular seating area up at the back here, close up to the hedge and the fence. Just large enough for a two or three seater table and chairs. And this is going to be raised above water level so that we can sit above the pond and look down at the livestock and the plants. And the pond itself is going to be more like a moat, which is going to surround the majority of the seating area so that we're totally enclosed in water and plants. Either side of what will be a stepping stone or a bridge that takes us over the, the pond are going to be two small stainless steel water blades pouring into the pond either side, which will create a nice soft sound, all important in any water feature. There'll be uplighters on either one of these water blades and some LED lighting inside those as well. If I use a bridge, then I'll probably put a third light underneath that bridge, which is going to be a fantastic down lighter for the pond. And if I use a stepping stone, I might well just have a third light submerged somewhere in the bottom of the pond. I want to make this feature a little bit more formal than some that I would normally build. Um, it may well be that I use polished limestone finish for the slabs on the seating area, but that's yet to be decided. As always, these things tend to evolve organically. So I'll kind of be making this one up as I go along. Um, a lot of plants to, to dig out and move away. It looks like quite a small enclosed space at the moment, but once it's been relieved of all of the plants and the foliage, actually this opens up, it's quite a nice space. I think the dimensions, the circular seating area is probably going to be eight to 10 foot in diameter. So not very large, but just big enough that we can sit down without any risk of sort of falling into the pond. And then the, the moat of the pond itself is going to be slightly wider than striding distance. So about four to, four to five feet or so in width. <laughs> My wife. <laughs> Curse you. <laughs> i got to get used to you. It's just a pain. We haven't, we haven't discussed dimensions apparently. I'm just going to just going to do it. So the circular ray seating area is going to be eight to ten foot in diameter, just large enough for a, a two or three seater without the risk of us slipping into the pond or the moat either side. And then the pond itself it's not going to be particularly large, slightly wider than striding distance, just to make it worthwhile to have a, a step or a bridge. Um, probably accommodating two marginal planting zones at either end. So all of this will be open water and then there'll be a large shallow planting zone over here and over here. So that will be totally encased in water and then planting behind it. This is a pond where I don't want to see any pond liner at all. Usually I would um, start stonework and rock work from perhaps 12 inches below water level. Um, some of the marginal shelves will be a little bit deeper, but the base of the pond will always be bare liner. This one I want to make it more of a formal feature than a pond. I think there will be fish. Uh, my kids won't let me get away without adding any fish, but for me the joy of this is going to be the wildlife it attracts, the sound of the water, the reflections, the movement. I don't want to see any pond liner. So the whole base is going to be covered in um, shingle or smaller cobbles. It's going to be higher maintenance as a result. Some of this is going to end up as a silt trap and we'll start to accumulate sediment and detritus. So I'll have to vacuum this out more frequently, but I'm not going to be adding messy fish, perhaps a few golden rod um, and only in small numbers. So it will be a very nice looking feature. I think as a backdrop behind the seating area, I probably will build some form of raised wall. Um, we're even toying with the idea of using some copper sheeting or some metal sheeting, something a little bit more formal. Again, this is going to evolve as the job progresses. I'm probably not going to be able to crack on and get this done in its entirety in one go. Um, so I'll be starting the excavation initially, getting the pond liner in and then trying to source some equipment and materials. I'm hoping Awaza are going to come good and, uh, and do me some good deals on some of this as I shall be using exclusively Awaza equipment, but we shall see, the jury's out. But yes, this will be my new pond. <laughs>
Well, as you can see, we've done the bulk of the clearing. We've dug up a lot of the plants, rescued many of them and potted them on. And we've now positioned a central spike so that we can work out a circle for the raised paved area. And that in turn is gonna have uh, the definition for the pond and the moat around it. So we've literally just attached a piece of line, a piece of string to the, I've got a piece of rebar here, which I've just hammered into the ground. And then I've marked off a four feet length of string and put a little loop on it so I can attach a spike. I'm just using a little flathead screwdriver here. And then I've just worked my way around scoring into the ground to create a perfect circle. And then from that, I've increased the length of the string an additional four feet to put an outer circle scored into the ground. And this is what's gonna become then the foundations, the definition for the moat. Now to make it a little bit clearer, I'm now spraying over the top with some red marker paint. Because I don't wanna lose the scoring that I've already marked on the floor. Boom, done. Now I can actually see it marked out on the floor and it's starting to take shape and it looks an awful lot larger already. So the outer ring is what will be pond and the inner ring is what will be the raised paved seating area. And about where that screwdriver is, that's gonna be a stepping stone. I think I've settled on a stepping stone now to reach the, the seating area. Now before I get too carried away with digging, I'm just going to use a, an edging tool, a half moon here, to very neatly dig away just a little channel, removing the turf, so that I can have a permanent defined line, because no doubt my kids are going to come along, the dog's going to run over this red line, scuff it up, and it's going to blur very quickly. So I don't want to lose that. And a half moon tool is going to be fantastic for that. You could use a, a nice sharp spade if it's relatively flat, not too curved. Although actually in this instance, a curved one will probably do the job just fine. And then I'm just gonna remove a little strip on the outer edge. Lovely. And that is going to give me a nice permanent defined template that I can dig around.
Well, that's the initial excavation done on the, on the footprint of the pond. It's a blooming hot day. I seem to always do this when it's really hot and it's nearly 30 degrees today, so not the best digging weather. So the next stage is, I don't want to reduce the size of the pond down. Once I start building stonework, of course, inside, that's gonna displace water, and I don't wanna do that, so I need to chop away a small section of the raised seating area now, just to accommodate sort of a stone's width of wall inside the pond. And then I can start to work out the central position for the stepping stones, mark out the marginal zones either side of the pond and then dig out the next stage and go deeper. I've got a lot of digging yet to do. I wish I hadn't been moaning about the sun. Weather's turned. It's manky, it's wet. And I have to say the soil here is very, very different to the kind of structure and soil that I'm used to digging to in the Sussex area. Um, this is almost kind of sandy and with just a tiny bit of moisture on, it's claggy, it's sticking to my boots and it's making a mess everywhere. I have to say also, it's quite difficult to get motivated to do your own job when you're not getting paid for it. But there we go. So I have dug out pretty much the entire footprint of the pond. Um, we're still nowhere near deep enough. This little stake here is what will be the surface area. So we're about 15 inches deep at the moment. I've got to go down at least as deep as that again in the deeper section. So a fair amount of digging to do. But before I do, I've had to dig out um, a foundation here, an area that I can shutter off and fill up with uh, a concrete pad to create a foundation for the stepping stones, which is what I've decided to do. I've, I've definitely decided not a bridge, but we're going to have stepping stones. So here you can see in this central section of the pond, before I can dig any deeper, I've needed to dig out this slightly deeper trench and just shutter that off. I've had some old bits of hardcore and concrete kicking around and I've just whacked down into the soft mud beneath just to create a bit more of a firm foundation before I pour some concrete on top. Uh, I'm gonna hand mix a load of uh, rapid set cement and some ballast and stones and bits and pieces just to create a, a nice solid foundation and that'll go off quick enough that I can then start digging a bit later on this afternoon around this either side. And what will end up happening is that this central section will be a slightly shallower area and then there'll be a deeper section of the pond to either side of the stepping stone here and here. Now I've come up with a cunning plan for the stepping stones. Originally I had toyed with the idea of just having one large central circle stone. I like the idea of keeping to the theme of circles and half circles and curves, so a round stepping stone would fit in nicely with this. But although that would work nicely with my long stride, it's not going to work with my children or my wife, and uh, they're going to be in risk of, of falling into the pond, which, although hilarious, probably not practical. So instead, we're going to have two smaller stepping stones, but I've got to make sure that there's enough of a gap that fish uh, and, and current, etc., can, can flow past the stepping stones kind of unhindered. So I'm going to use a pot or a bucket, probably something like this, and this shape, which is slightly conical. Fill it up with concrete, let it set, tap it out like a giant sandcastle, and what's left is going to be a nice concrete-shaped plinth like this, which will stand nicely on top of this foundation, of course, once the line has gone down, and I can cement that into place. And then on top of this, I can then cement some nice circular sandstone pieces of stone to act as stepping stones. Okay. Yes, please. It just doesn't normally look after me this well. Right, this is a bit like mixing a cake. I've got a lot of leftover materials that I just want to use up, so it's a little bit ad hoc. But I should be mixing up um, essentially a five to one mix using rapid set cement just because I'm a bit impatient and I want this to go off a lot quicker so I can continue digging uninterrupted. And I've just got a mixture of sharp sand, some builder sand or soft sand, some 20 mil gravel, some 10 mil gravel and obviously my rapid set cement. And I'm just going to mix up essentially a concoction of what will equate to be five to one. So 
I've done three parts sharp sand, which is a bit grittier. One part soft or builder sand, which is a lot finer. So one part 20 mil gravel. And when I run out of that, I've got some 10 mil gravel and other bits and pieces as well. Again, I'm being a little bit lazy here. It's not really enough mixed here to warrant getting the cement mixer out. Um, I could get my little egg whisk, but again, there's not a tremendous amount here to mix up. And because I'm doing a pouring a foundation, it's gonna be a very wet sort of runny mix. So it's gonna be quite easy to mix it by hand like this. Now I just dry mix together loosely all of the dry materials before I add some water. And then bake it in the oven, 200 degrees for 20 minutes. And you'll get a nice solid foundation. Right, I'm gonna carry on mixing some of this up get this poured into the hole and show you the finished result. There we go. So that's the concrete pad or the concrete foundation filled and complete. This is about five inches thick with a base of hardcore at the bottom. And this is gonna be ample to provide a nice bit of sturdy support for the stepping stones above. And the finishing touches is just to tamp over the top of the, the pad with a nice smooth straight stick or a level. smooths off the surface nicely, helps to get rid of some of the, the air bubbles that might be trapped within the concrete, so that brings that to the surface, which would otherwise weaken it, although again, you know, structurally, we're not building a house on this, this is just a couple of stepping stones, but more importantly, it's just going to create a smooth surface, which is easy to lay the liner on on top afterwards, there we go, job done, so in about half an hour that'll be touch dry, and within an hour or so, I'll be able to walk on that. And digging can commence. Good afternoon, everybody. It's another day on the job. I've had uh, a few days of working on other projects and I've not been able to tackle my own pond. I uh, had an interesting job last week where I was rescuing some fish on a, a local pond that was drying up, which you may well have viewed. It's nice to get back onto my pond. Now I've pretty much finished the excavation of the pond itself and I'm just kind of scratching around making sure that everything's level, that all the sides are vertical or, or at the correct angle that I want before uh, lining. But this particular pond, because I've got the central section here which is filled up with a concrete footing or foundation for the stepping stones, um, it's not quite so easy to be able to get a level across from one side of that to the other to make sure that both sides of this are, are equal. Because it's quite a formal pond, I want to make sure that any depths and angles and faces and bits and pieces I've dug out on this side mirror that side of the pond because it's going to be very symmetrical and very formal. So I'm getting my laser out here so that I can get an idea of levels. Um, and I thought I'd show you guys just briefly an introduction on using a laser for doing the ponds. Now this is a pretty basic, cheap and cheerful Screwfix special um, Dewalt laser here. I'm sure other manufacturers are available. Um, this cost me, ooh, I don't know, about £150. And then I bought the tripod um, as an additional thing. And it's absolutely invaluable uh, when building ponds. Um, very simply, you've got a laser module here, which you can switch on to do a horizontal or a vertical line. And once it's set up level, it doesn't have to be on a tripod, it can be just positioned sat on top of some blocks or even on the ground if it's at the correct height and level. But what that will do is that will project a laser beam, a line, horizontally or vertically over quite a range. This one's got a range of about 50 meters, I believe. And then from that vertical or horizontal level line, you've got a permanent reference that you can use then to obtain different heights and levels spanning a very large area. Now don't worry if that doesn't make too much sense. Uh, to be honest, it was a little bit confusing for me when I first started using it as well. Um, and I'm always so familiar with just using some basic manual levels that it took me um, a little while to get used to using the laser, but it's fantastic and I couldn't be without it now. So if you imagine that this laser is projecting, and I always tend to use it obviously horizontally because I'm 
basing it as a reference against water level and the water in the pond is always going to be level. So if you imagine that you've got a string that's stretched across a certain area which is dead level at a certain height and then from that string you can using a vertical tool and it can be anything a level a measure a stick but from that you can then offer that up against that string and that will give you a reference as to whether the ground beneath it is higher or lower based on how much of the vertical stick is sticking up higher or lower than that string but instead of a string we've got a, a laser beam now of course you can't see that laser um, unless you're out at night time and actually it's quite convenient doing it when it's low light or when it is dark because then you can see the line marked up against the tool you're offering up against it quite some distance away from the laser module um, and it saves a bit of faffing around using a receiver but in bright sunshine and during the daytime along with the laser module you'll want a receiver and what this does is it's got a little infrared screen on there and when that comes into contact with the laser beam with that level string if you like it will beep and it will change tone depending on whether the laser beam is higher or lower than the sensor or the receiver on this handheld unit and I shall demonstrate like so so you can't see it there's no red laser beams uh, imprinted across my, my face or there shouldn't be but somewhere around here is a permanent horizontal level beam of light which I can use then as a reference so if I start to raise this up until I get to the height of the laser beam it will start to make a noise if I turn it on there we go now the tones change whether the laser is higher or lower than the central face which is marked on this but you've also got a handy arrow pointing up or pointing down and once that laser is dead center to this receiver where there is a line get a permanent fixed tone there we go now what I like to do is when I'm working around I'll use my level and I'll hold that up as level as I can and I will move my receiver I mean sometimes I can see the in fact I can see it right now even though it's bright sunshine I'm what seven or eight feet away from the laser module and I can see clearly here a red line across the level but if I was some distance away I wouldn't be able to see that and if I couldn't see that I would then use this until I got to a solid tone and then I would mark that on the level and I've got a reference and then I can move to a different position and position this and depending on whether the laser beam is higher than that mark or lower than that mark will dictate whether the ground is higher or lower and then I can work my way around with these points of reference that are uniform at the same height and make sure that either side of this is level and uniform. Now I could do the same, I could knock in some pegs into the ground and work my way around with a level um, such as this, but that would be quite time consuming. So this is a really, really good time saving exercise and over large areas it's, you know, it's an essential tool really. Now it's really important to note when you're using a laser to work out levels like this, that once you've positioned your laser module that you leave it in position and you don't move it. Because of course that's your reference line, your reference string. And when you're working your way around a certain area, you've got to ensure that that string, that line isn't moving. If you do end up moving it, then you're going to have to start from the beginning, from the first reference point, and then work your way around again. So I know this side is acceptable and happy with this side. I'm going to move my laser and my attention to the other side of the concrete plinth here. I know that that side's an inch or two higher, but I'm going to get the laser on it and just double check and then just start to scrape away a little bit and get that side looking good as well. The sun is shining, it's a lovely day. I'm going to get my vitamin D and crack on. So having worked out my levels on the other side of the pond over here, I've got a line that I've just etched drawn onto my level. 
Um, I've also drawn an arrow facing upwards because it's quite easy to put your level down and then to forget which way around it goes and you've got a line, a reference, and you're not quite sure what it means. So I always will draw a line and then I'll draw an arrow facing up so I know which way to, to hold and position this level. Now you can buy a purpose-made measuring stick which has got obviously you know measures in certain increments that the receiver will slot into a, a little a little harness a cradle that will slide up and down and that's fantastic but for this kind of use um, I find just the level is absolutely fine. So now I'm going to make sure that this side of the pond by positioning the base of the level at ground level and gauging that red line that laser beam against the pencil mark I've put on the level that will give me a reference as to whether the ground here is higher or lower than that side and of course because the ground itself here is um, is horizontal is flat I can just use a smaller manual level lay that down on the ground and just make sure that this is all flat now positioning this here I can actually see the laser beam here we go and it's exactly an inch lower than the the line on that side of the pond and what that means is that the ground here is one inch higher than that side. As I raise up the base of the level further and further, the laser beam drops down lower and lower. And the opposite happens. If the ground was deeper, then the laser beam would be higher than that mark. So I know here that the ground is about an inch higher than that side. To be honest, an inch difference under two feet of water with a bit of gravel, that's perfectly acceptable. I'm fine with that. I know that the, step, the steps and the marginal planting shelves over here are both uniform and to within about 10 mil of the other side. So again, that's absolutely fine, those margins. So I'm just gonna work my way around now, scraping and tamping using my little manual tamp, just to get the ground really nice and firm and to get rid of any obtrusions, stones and roots and bits and pieces in preparation for the lining. It's been a little while since I've posted anything on this pond. As you can see, the weather is rubbish, that's not helped. Apologies for the sound quality. Um, unfortunately, my GoPro has had a bit of a malfunction and I can no longer use the uh, wireless remote mic, which makes a huge difference to sound quality. So there's gonna be an awful lot of wind noise until GoPro send me a replacement part. I apologize. Currently have a pond. Not deliberately, but the weather has been that bad that it's stopped draining away and it's now pooling. Since I last did any sort of documentation on this, I have leveled out the base of the pond, made sure that the angles are all nice and accurate, and I've actually dug away a little bit more to make the pond slightly wider, which has made that central circular portion there slightly smaller. I've tested it with a table and chairs. It's absolutely fine, plenty of space. This will mean that once I build up my internal stonework here I'm not losing too much of that pond and the internal stonework line will then marry up much nicer with the stonework that's going to become the sort of raised wall behind now I've just sort of dry stone laid some stonework here just so I get an idea a bit of an impression of of the overall dimensions and size um, off camera I have dug out a trench and created some footings so you can see here we've got a nice concrete concrete footing which is providing the foundation for the walling here. And you can't see it, because it's underwater, but I've got two footings, a strip here, and a strip here of concrete, and again, over here and over here. And that's because normally when I'm building ponds, the stonework will only start perhaps a foot or so lower than pond level. So there's very little weight on the ground beneath and not a tremendous amount of stone. In this pond, I'm gonna be doing stonework right from the base of the pond, to the sides, to the edges of the pond. So I've got a lot more stonework, a lot more height of walling, and a lot more weight um, bearing down on the ground beneath. So I wanted to make sure I had some sort of substantial footing beneath. So it was just a simple trench dug down sort of 10 inches or so and, and filled with some concrete. So I am now finally at the stage where we can add the lining and get some water in the pond.
Of course I'm going to have to drain it back out again so I can start to lay some of this stonework. But it'll be nice just to get the water to fill up. Oh, it'll be nice to get the excavation filled up with water just to see the overall size of what this will eventually look like. I've had a bit of a result with getting products and materials for this. Uh, Gordon Lowe, a fantastic pond liner company that I always use, um, are helping to fund this and have given me a good discount on some pond liner and some fleece. And Awaza, who of course I always mention and use in all of my construction jobs, again for my own personal use, have, have come good and given me a very good discount on some products. So at some stage during this video I will promote these guys and give you some links and some details towards them um, and I'm looking forward to getting into all of the goodies um, the equipment from Awaza I've got some new tech that I haven't used before um, so looking forward to getting into those boxes and having a look which I'll show you in the meantime let's hope the weather holds out it does look like it's going to be better for the next few days but the last three or four days it's been torrential rain and I've really not been able to get out and do anything and actually I was a little bit concerned I don't like to leave the excavation ex exposed like this for too long because it's quite easy for the ground and the edges to start to crumble and to cave in. And having spent such a long time very neatly sculpting this, I don't want to lose these nice defined edges. So the sooner I can get some fleece and some liner in here, the better. You can probably hear in my voice, I've got a bit of a cold. Negative for COVID, but positive for man flu, I'm afraid. The stonework I'm using for this is the old familiar York stone that I like to use. There were some, you can see obviously the full size pieces at the back over there, which is what I've used dry stone for the walling. But for this pile of rock over here, I've actually cut it in half so that I can reveal or, or create sort of two pieces, two faces of stone to try and make it go a bit further. This is a, a piece I've not touched. So you can see it's, it's been cropped or guillotined with a machine. And that means you don't get that smooth edge that you get when you cut it with a, with a disc cutter like this. Something like that, that's a nice width. I wouldn't want to reduce that down, but some of these pieces have arrived much, much fatter. Um, so I've been able to cut down the center of those to create effectively two pieces. Now this stone is a lot more expensive as a material than concrete or you know other rubble and bits and pieces I've got. So to make this go further and to stretch it out, cut them in half and I'll be able to double up effectively the face of walling that I'll be able to create. So all of this is going to have to be washed before I can use it, but at least I've got some materials to get on with. over the horrible wind noise. Again, I'm sorry about that. I'm just going around making sure that there's no final sharp objects that are protruding that could damage the pond liner. So sharp stones of which, unfortunately, in my garden, in this ground, there's a lot, and little protruding roots and bits and pieces. Uh, there's not too many roots here, but there's certainly a lot of stones that are sticking out. So I'm just running my hands over the ground, making sure there's nothing sticking out which might potentially damage the liner. I've also put an inch or so of just a bit of sharp sand over the bottom of this, just to help level it out, and again, to prevent any stones and sharp objects and bits and pieces from potentially damaging the liner. Just a bit of cushioning. The foundation here, which has been put into place for the stepping stones, and I can't remember if I've documented that or not, but if not, I had also poured a foundation here onto which the stepping stones will go once the pond is, is almost completed. But I didn't want the, the very stark, sort of sharp, um, 90 degree concrete bend on there, uh, or edge which is a bit sharp for the pond liner. So I've just gone over that with a grinder and just ground that down just to smooth it off a little bit. So I'm now at the position to start putting the fleece down and then the pond liner. It's not particularly great weather for using the fleece. It's very windy. My garden's always extremely windy. It's quite exposed back and onto fields. And uh, on my own solo, it's inevitable that the fleece is gonna get caught up in the wind and lift up. So I'm actually gonna soak the fleece first. Just give it a hosing down with some water just to get it a little bit heavier and hope that the sections I've put down are gonna remain in place long enough for me to then put the pond liner on top. <laughs> 